Good morning, everyone. It's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Um, for our, our, we're looking today at uh, part of the story of the Exodus. That is where uh, God freed the Hebrew slaves from Egypt and um, brought them out safely through the Red Sea, despite all the, the army chasing them. And um, then the plan was for God to give Moses the laws for the people to live by. But while Moses is up on the mountain, um, they get impatient and they need something simpler, something more familiar, like what they had back in Egypt, believe it or not, where they were slaves. And um, so they, they all convince Aaron, the priest, to make them a golden calf. And they worship them and they give it credit for the stuff that God did for them. Um, well, that doesn't go over so well, and um, there are various consequences. And, you know, when we come into our story, um, we're going to be reading from Exodus 33. Um, Moses is having an argument with God. That's actually Moses' superpower. He argues with God, and sometimes God lets him win. So here we go. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place. You and the people you brought up out of Egypt and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go with you, because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. People heard this, these distressing words. They began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, you are stiff-necked people. Um, if I were to go with you even for a moment, I might destroy you. Take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb, which is also Mount Sinai. Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, lead these people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you, and remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, then do not send us up from here. How will anyone know you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. So where to start a sermon on this slightly puzzling passage? All the detective shows say to follow the money, so let's do that. Uh, they weren't carrying any U.S. currency, so I guess the ornaments would be the closest in this passage. Ornaments as in jewelry. Um, so, you know, here's the question. Until recently, the Hebrew people, the people we're talking about, were slaves in Egypt. So where did slaves get jewelry? Uh, Exodus 12 the Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and they gave them what they asked for, and so they plundered the Egyptians. So God got the jewelry for them so they would not leave Egypt empty-handed. God gave them reparations from their time of enslavement. All right, next question. What did the Hebrews do with the jewelry God got for them? Well, a lot of it went into making the golden calf in Exodus 32. Moses was up on the mountain speaking with God. The people got nervous. They go to Aaron, come make us gods who will go before us. Aaron said, take off your gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And then they said, here are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt, giving the calf credit for what God did. <laughs> okay, so the earrings are gone. Um, 
But I just have to tell you what happened to the golden calf, right? Exodus 32, 20, Moses came down from the mountain, took the calf the people had made, burned it in the fire, he ground it into powder, he scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. <laughs> talk about that, for, talk about penance, right? All right, now we arrive at today's passage where God commands them to get rid of the rest of it. All the gold, jewels, all their wealth they brought out of Egypt, get rid of it. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. That's kind of a big deal, but not when you compare it with the larger threat. In case you missed it from the reading, God told Moses that he was so angry he might destroy the Hebrew people. This is what leads to Moses' argument with God. One of the preconditions for negotiation was the people getting rid of their ornaments. Now, why did God want them to do that? Well, the short answer is sin, but hear me out. We sinful human beings consistently misuse all the gifts God gives us. We learn how to farm, so let's clear all the farmland around our town for more fields. Oops, we cut down the trees and all our soil erodes into the river. Um, <laughs> we create weapons for hunting so we can eat. Oops, the weapons work on other people too. Warfare. We learn how to produce more goods so that people have better lives. Oops, we also create exploited workers, wealth inequality, and global warming thanks to our industrial revo revolution pollution. Wow, nuclear energy could help us in so many ways. You know where this is going, right? Nuclear waste and nuclear bombs. We human beings do this so often in so many ways that no one could possibly track or list them all. The basic idea is this. Anything, anything that makes us feel like we can make it on our own leads us to think that we don't need God and it turns into an idol and we get bit by the law of unintended consequences. So sometimes we're better off with nothing. So off with your ornaments. It says in Exodus 33, at least when we have nothing, we know that we have to rely on God. Remember when Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs and insisted they take nothing with them for the journey? He didn't expect them to live that way all the time, but a healthy dose of it was good for them. Heck, even Jesus said this about himself. Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Here's a little quote from Dr. Walter Bergman, one of my professors. In this post-calf situation, Israel, constituted by God's mercy and in spite of God's rage, is to unburden itself of such possessions. Because God speaks, Israel has a post-calf possibility, but it must forego the commodities that seduce and distort. Love that phrase, commodities that seduce and distort. Watch out for those. You know, if divesting of resources and possessions one makes one realize our need for God, leading to spiritual maturity and increased faith, then the members of the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park are spiritually mature and possessed of a strong faith. That's my personal opinion of this lovely group. Um, as they, and I'm using this Bible text to back it up. They are giving up their building and resources and going out into the world to find another church, um, trusting that God will be with them. And God will be with us all. Uh, and the wonderful budding relationship with our new friends at the First Presbyterian Church of Maywood is evidence of that. In fact, you can find evidence of God's presence all along. Wherever there is healing, whether, wherever hurting people are comforted, wherever the poor and the people in prison are given hope, wherever kindness abounds, wherever violent urges are calm and ruptured relationships are reconciled, we can be sure that God is somehow present. Which is why God's threat to be absent is so terrifying. God says to Moses, look, I'm keeping my promise. I'm going to give you all that nice land I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but you're on your own. I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you along the way. 
I hope that quote helps you to understand the precarious situation the whole Salvation Project was in, that it was hanging by a thread. Because without God's presence, none of those good things I mentioned happen. There is no salvation without the presence of God. There is no liberation without the presence of God. There is no hope without the presence of God. You might have a lot of land or a lot of money or some great jewelry, but none of that matters. Not without God. Moses is terrified that God might carry out his threat. But Moses is also getting used to speaking with God, arguing with God. So here's what he says in verse, starting at verse 13. If you are pleased with me, so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you and remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses reiterates the point. If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, because I am pleased with you and because I know you by name. This has to be one of Moses' great moments. He gets God to calm down and rescind the threat. And do you know what he does now? He doesn't go with the wind. He raises the stakes and asks for something more. God has already demonstrated one of the greatest examples of material blessings in history with the exodus, the freeing of the slaves from Egypt. God has already told Moses that he is pleased with him and knows him by name. But now Moses asks for more and receives it. Let me close by reading to you what comes next. Verses 17 to 23. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. And Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live, meaning we couldn't handle it. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. This is the end where Moses gets this amazing experience of a, a little bit of a view of God that really nobody gets. Um, what a remarkable thing that is. Um, I find this to be a very comforting story, uh, if an odd one, and I hope that you do too. God bless.